if anyone can't hear, just ask me to speak up. I, I generally can talk pretty loud, so hopefully uh, everybody can hear me. Um, my name again is Stephanie Belseth. I'm a pediatric nurse practitioner. I am the founder of Newbridge Clinic and uh, the owner, and um, I got into Lyme kind of in a roundabout way. Um, I got married and had kids, and, and uh, my second child ended up having a lot of medical problems. And um, he had hypogamma globulinemia, which is an um, immune system problem. He had severe colic. He had gastrointestinal issues. He had allergies. He just, he was sick all the time. And um, all of you mothers and fathers in the room know that, you know, you will do anything for your child. So I was on a quest to figure out why he was sick. And, and the best of Western medicine and all the different specialists we went to in state, out of state, couldn't figure out, you know, exactly what, you know, what was wrong with him. They could figure out that he had X, Y, or Z problems, but not uh, exactly what was causing it. And so um, I went on to uh, go to a practitioner out of state who was able to help at that time. And uh, he, he went on to develop um, some neurodevelopmental problems and autistic symptoms. And um, we were actually able, through functional medicine and integrative medicine and some specialized approaches uh, of treating underlying infections and, and toxins as, as a big part of that, to reverse that. And he um, doesn't meet criteria at this point and he's, he's doing really, really well. And what we found um, out was that Lyme was part of the problem for him so uh, and for his two, two siblings. So um, they got it from me in utero, and um, I didn't know. I, I had at the time, it was, uh, you know, I was pretty healthy, but carrying it and <laughs> when immunosuppressed during pregnancy, um, transferred it, it to them. So basically, Lyme kind of has come around the back door, and as a result, um, I have uh, learned to treat it very well. Um, in my own family and in my patients, and uh, basically, I want to be able to share my knowledge with all of you and anyone who's who's suffering from this. So, um, Lyme can really uh, show up in different ways for for different people, and uh, a lot of what I see in pediatrics is uh, neurodevelopmental disorders that are in part triggered by Lyme. So, um, it's not just Lyme; it can be a lot of other infections. You know, we see um, mycoplasma and uh, chlamydia and HSV6 and EBV and all kinds of other infections, you know, co-infections, Bartonella, et cetera, contributing. But um, infections are a big uh, source of uh, chronic neurodevelopmental uh, and physical issues in kids. But in kids, it seems to really hit the nervous system more so. Uh, so that's a lot of what, what I do. Um, and I'd say probably the last six years or so, we've been treating a lot more uh, Lyme, just straight up Lyme as well. Um, at Newbridge. We have um, some additional practitioners, which I'll tell you about. Um, but first, I'll just um, talk about our mission. So part of our mission is really making uh, integrative medicine, functional medicine uh, available to everyone. So we really want to make it affordable and accessible and provide uh, care for people that are really struggling. So we tend to see a lot of really sick patients. So um, I get a lot of the patients that have been to lots of other places and not gotten better. And, um, and I really know how expensive it is to do that when you're not able to work um, and uh, you have a lot uh, of burden um, with living with chronic illness or taking care of a child with chronic illness. So we have um, started to do some group visits to try to make things more affordable so you can be seen in a group with people with like diagnosis and um, have a, you know, a better ability to be able to be seen regularly and, and receive the right kind of care that you need. Um, we also have a lot of other new things I'll tell you about later too which are um, exciting. But um, these are just our practitioners. Um, I treat pediatrics. We have um, Dr. Kathy Dolan, who's a family practice doctor. She has attended ILADS and uh, will be doing a preceptorship as soon as she's able to figure that out in terms of timing. We uh, have Kathy Moore, who's a PA, who has uh, family members with Lyme and has lived it and understands it and is living it. So uh, I think there's nothing better to help teach um, a good practitioner how to be a better practitioner um, is to have to kind of walk, walk it um, and deal with some of these things themselves. Uh, and then Marlis is our pediatrician, and she is not doing a lot of chronic Lyme treatment, but she is certainly very Lyme aware and treating a lot of acute Lyme and kind of getting people started if they can't get in to see uh, the other practitioners right away um, so that people can be, can be seen right away. And she's, she's really excellent, too, and has training in integrative and functional medicine. So tick season is here. Um, I've already found a tick on my child um, after walking around in the uh, Roberts Bird Sanctuary near Lake Harriet. So uh, luckily it wasn't attached, but and um, we had, you know, 
gotten a little lazy and not uh, good lesson for me. We had gone out and we were at the band shell and uh, didn't think we were going to go into the woods, but we ended up going into the woods. But um, just really important to keep your um, tick repellent with you in the car because you might have an off-road adventure that you really need to make sure that you have uh, protection. Um, and this time in the spring, we know that ticks are really small, so they can be a size of a puppy seed, and you may not even know that they are uh, on you. So um, please make sure that you are uh, keeping some protection. There was a study done by the Consumer Reports group that showed that lemon eucalyptus works as well as DEET to repel ticks and mosquitoes, and it's much safer from um, a toxic um, standpoint. So um, you can get something called Repel at REI or Target, and it's like, five or six dollars, and, uh, and that is a good non-toxic um, way to try to protect yourself. You do need to reply a little bit, um, reapply a little bit more often than maybe a DEET um, type of uh, anti-insect um, rep repellent. Um, so most of this talk is going to really focus on the treatment of Lyme, uh, but I did just want to give a little bit of background about the history. And um, you, you maybe already all know this, but in 1975, um, Lyme was first identified in the town of Lyme, Connecticut. Uh, in, in 1982, uh, Willie Bergdorfer um, discovered the bacteria responsible for causing Lyme and, you know, was very interested in, in the fact that it looked almost exactly like syphilis. So it's, it's kind of a cousin to syphilis. In 2012, Lyme disease was included by the CDC as one of the top 10 um, notifiable diseases, meaning that doctors and nurse practitioners and, and PAs seeing doctors have to notify um, the local health department if they uh, are diagnosing a case. I will say that this is, doesn't happen very well. Um, so at Children's, when I worked there, it was never talked about, no one did it, you know, so there's a lot of, I mean, and this has been a while since I was, I, I, you know, since, since I was at Children's, it's been maybe nine, 10 years or so since I've been there, but it really wasn't something that people were reporting um, regularly. So certainly, kind of, we were supposed to do it, but, um, but uh, it, you know, doctors are busy and um, it's one more form to fill out. And, uh, you know, I do really believe that our numbers for Lyme in the state and in the country are vastly underreported. Um, and the problem is much bigger than, um, than uh, we have numbers for. Um, basically, in 2012, uh, the Lyme spirochete was found in Otzi, who was a caveman. As some of you may have read the articles about uh, him, he was found in intact, perfect shape, frozen in a, in a glacier up in the Alps. And um, they've been doing lots of research on him to try to learn more about, uh, he's you know, over 5,000 5, years old, to learn about uh, humans at that time. And they found the spirochete um, in him. And um, he didn't die of Lyme. He actually died of a head blow and a, a shoulder um, spear between his shoulder blades, but um, Lyme has been around for a long time. And, and it's an interesting concept because I, I don't believe that Lyme caused us many problems until our immune systems became more burdened so that we can't handle the Lyme infection. And so um, I think that, that you know, we you know, certainly, I think there have been individuals that were more vulnerable that probably have had problems with Lyme for quite a bit longer than we've had, uh, had it identified. But um, for the most part, I think a lot of people have gotten Lyme and not had problems with it. And, and a point that I think kind of shows this a little bit better is in pets, if there's any veterinarians in the room, um, about 85% of uh, dogs will come up positive as Lyme, but uh, most of them are not sick, and they, they're very healthy and, and are, are just fine. So um, I think that uh, when you don't have immune systems you know, burdened, uh, our immune systems can't handle some of these things. Unfortunately, I think all of us at this point in time are um, impacted by immune system burden because of environmental toxins and uh, because of external um, uh, things that are problematic for us. Um, antibiotics, which uh, are a problem with the uh, gut microbiome. So we know that 70% of our microbiome is influenced by our gut. And uh, if you have a poor microbiome, all those good bacteria in your gut, um, you are not going to have a very healthy immune system. So there's been lots of onslaughts to, the, to our gut microbiome. And the NIH has um, commissioned research uh, that has been about eight years old now on the Human Microbiome Project 
to try to figure out what all those bacteria do in our bodies and their impact on health. And through that research, we've come to uh, confirm what naturopathic medicine and Chinese medicine, a lot of other people have known for a long time, that the gut is the center of our health. So we have to really take care of our gut issues. And SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, uh, which Bradley Bush has new technology to, to test, um, basically is one of those conditions. And in fact, I was at a lecture earlier this year, and a presenter had collected data in his practice um, showing that of his chronic Lyme patients, he tested all of them for SIBO, and 70% of them had SIBO. And um, when treating that 70% for SIBO, you know, 80% of them had vast improvements in their Lyme symptoms, so just by treating their gut issues. So very important to make sure that we're not kind of only attacking the bug, you know, and not looking at our whole bodies and our, our ecosystem and um, everything else that, that comes into play with that. So OTSI has taught us um, a lot, and in, in 2015, um, the CDC has estimated that 329,000 people in the country are infected with Lyme. As I said, I think that that's a vast underreporting, but um, it's, it's growing dramatically. And Lyme is now in more states, um, identified in more states than, than ever before. And this year is going to be a bumper crop for ticks because of the last two mild winters. And the recent um, testing of mice um, shows that there's going, it's probably going to be a bad year for Lyme. So um, basically, all the more important for us all to be careful and make sure we tell all of our family and friends to be careful um, to prevent um, tick bites. You know, Oxy might have indirectly been killed by Lyme because maybe he was in a weakened state and couldn't fight off that attack. That is a possibility, absolutely. Yeah, that is a possibility. So, um, so Lyme disease is a collective diagnosis. I think a lot of people think of Lyme as only Borrelia burgdorferi, but we know that Lyme is really that plus all of the co-infections. So Bartonella, Babesia, Ehrlichia, Anaplasma, you know, Q fever, um, recommended spot, uh, spotted fever, uh, plus mycoplasma, and then a plethora of parasites and, and viruses also are usually um, accompany um, Lyme. So a lot of times uh, people may have antibiotics or treatment targeted for their Lyme, but their co-infections are missed. They don't, they don't treat adequately the other infections that are on board. And so I think that that's very important. Uh, and we know too that Lyme is not only transmitted by ticks uh, anymore. So there is research showing that um, ticks are transmitted by other um, insects and the co-infections are transmitted by other uh, insects and animals. Bartonella is trans transmitted by cats, for example. Um, there is a study published showing that um, lice, head lice can transmit Bartonella. Um, so um, we do uh, have to worry about some other bugs. Mosquitoes can uh, transmit many different viruses. So uh, basically, we want to try to avoid any vector um, bites um, as much as possible. So Lyme disease is often called the great imitator because it imitates so many other infections. And so many uh, people are diagnosed with MS or they're diagnosed with ALS or they're diagnosed with you know, autism or a lot of other things that really stem from infections uh, such, as, such as Lyme. So I think that um, we always have to kind of look when you know, there's a diagnosis of, of chronic fatigue syndrome or fibromyalgia or whatever, what, it, what else might be going on and have we uncovered all of those stones to make sure that we've looked at it everything and ruled everything out. Um, so it's also very um, crafty and it has a, Borella itself has a, a corkscrew shape and likes to evade the immune system and uh, move to different parts of, of the body and uh, resist getting killed. So it's, it's a persister bacteria and um, that makes it very difficult to kill. So in kids, who is my main population, um, a lot of people are getting Lyme through maternal transmission. So we have good evidence um, published in the literature that Lyme is transmitted through breast milk. The evidence for maternally uh, acquired uh, Lyme in utero is not as strong, but um, anecdotally and through all the practitioners around the United States that are my colleagues, we know that Lyme is transmitted uh, in utero because we have babies that are born that we test, um, their cord blood or we're testing the PCR in their urine and they come back positive. Um, they're too young to have gotten, you know, some of them we test when they're, you know, toddlers um, or infants and, and they haven't been outside. They haven't, you know, been anywhere where, where there were ticks or other um, vectors. So um, essentially that's a whole nother um, mode of transmission that I think is not really appreciated by many um, individuals uh, and, and practitioners. 
of course, there's also acute vector bites. And I think one of the worst things is, is when you have prenatal exposure uh, or infection from the breast milk, and then you get another tick bite. You know, that, that really tends to ha cause more, more problems for people. So the typical symptoms of Lyme in children, especially more of an acute um, infection, is more the typical migratory joint pain, aches and pains, <laughs> headaches, fatigue, lethargy, sore throat, swollen glands, rashes, you know, night and day sweats, many, many, many more. But those are kind of more what we see in someone who has a healthier immune system, you know, the bullseye rash, um, classic kind of things that we see. And people that don't have a healthier immune system, they can't mount that antibody response. They can't mount the response that can, that's going to give them that rash and let them know Know that they have Lyme if they have a good practitioner and are, are observant. Um, so unfortunately, because many people don't get these symptoms right away um, or don't get a rash, they miss the diagnosis. And um, it may come up later with fatigue or you know, generalized complaints, um, but uh, Lyme may be the, the factor um, to trigger things. Um, in terms of chronic Lyme, they present a little differently. So in kids, um, it's more vague and intermittent physical complaints. Um, oftentimes they have poor school performance despite having you know, high intellect. Um, there's a lot of mental health disorders that present, psychiatric illness, um, oppositional defiant disorder, anxiety, depression, um, obsessive compulsive disorder um, can be triggered by uh, Lyme and the related co-infections. Um, learning disorders dyslexia, um, dysgraphia, dyscalculia, etc., can have a basis in infections triggering the immune system, uh, as well as uh, PANDAS, um, ADHD, and autism. Um, I'm not saying that all of these disorders are caused by Lyme, but for a subset of children with these disorders, Lyme is a big factor. So um, we have had many kids in our practice that we've treated for these disorders that we've successfully treated for Lyme and other infections um, who have lost their diagnosis and uh, were able to you know, uh, revert to having healthy, normal, happy, happy lives. So, um, something that I think you know is an area that we need to do more research on. There's no research on this, so this is just totally anecdotal, based on practitioners that are treating uh, children with these disorders from more of a um, ILADS integrative medicine, functional medicine approach. So statistics, um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, are really under-reporting under the Lyme that's out there. And um, we in the Minnesota um, community have a, a group of physicians uh, and practitioners that treat Lyme that meet regularly. And um, we've really been, you know, trying to encourage everyone to make sure that they report every case of Lyme, you know, um, to the Department of Health so that we get better, count, better counts and, and better um, recording. So Lyme is a persister as I mentioned earlier, which um, is in a class of different microbes that are very difficult to kill. So Johns Hopkins did some research uh, in the last couple of years on persister um, bugs and Lyme and Bartonella and Babesia and many of the infections that many people are struggling with are in that category. And I think that that's one of the reasons why uh, chronic Lyme exists and is so difficult to treat. Um, so we have to use a lot of different strategies to treat um, these bugs and um, Dr. Uh, Horowitz has doing uh, some research on Dapsone, and that's been a treatment that has been very successful for Babesia and some of the non-responder uh, Lyme patients. Are you utilizing we are using Dapsone uh, in adults so far. I have not done it in children yet. Um, it's got a lot of side effects, and there aren't good studies in children. So and Dr. Horowitz hasn't done it in children. Um, when I spoke to him last, at least, at the last conference I saw him at. So um, it's not the first thing I'm going to go to, and he recommends that you try everything first before you move to that. Um, but it it's, is an option that can be really helpful. Are you keeping track of your, um, you know, of your patients and how well they're doing with it? Yes. And would we be able to at all get those statistics? Yeah, um, Dr. Dolan is just starting to treat with Dapsone, and and, sh and uh, once we have more data on it, we'd be happy to um, share what we're finding with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's an antibiotic and it's an anti-leprosy medication actually, originally. Um, it causes severe anemia and when I was out um, shadowing with Dr. Horowitz, he was doing some of his initial research on it and um, at that time he was doing a two-month protocol. Now he is doing longer protocols and um, the dosing is, is, is quite different than what he was doing originally. Uh, and basically you have to give leucovorin or 5-methylfolate or other things along with it um, uh, to help with some of those issues. It is, it, there are a lot of side effects, yeah. I mean, so that's, that's one of the reasons why we don't use it uh, 
uh, lightly. So it, it's, you know, I think a lot of times when people are really sick, they're like, I'll do anything. But there are a lot of side effects to a lot of these um, treatments, and so we have to kind of weigh the risks and benefits and make sure that we're doing comprehensive treatment um, and, and considering all the, all the risks and the benefits. Mm -hmm. Per year, yes. Your slide did not say that. Oh, okay. Uh, make that correction for the audience who aren't here tonight. That yeah, that is per year. The CDC statistics. Yeah. That puts us at about twelve to fourteen thousand cases per year in Minnesota. Yeah. <laughs> and it's and it, I think it's maybe more than that. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, so in the test tube, um, these persister bugs are, are hard to treat. So um, Dr. Zhang and colleagues, um, uh, there's some research out of Johns Hopkins that is looking at test tube studies, looking at how to eradicate Lyme. And we used to think that Lyme didn't turn into the cyst form until a little later into the disease. But in the test tube, it already starts to form into the round body form or the cyst form after three days. So the spirochete form uh, can morph very quickly. And uh, essentially, this kind of makes it more difficult because if, if the um, disease can go into resistance form that quickly, um, it, it's just that much harder to treat. So using a combination of, of three different antibiotics, um, with Adapsin being one of them, uh, there was the ability in test tube to kill Lyme and, and the related um, cysts. Um, however, we know that in, in, vivo, in vitro, uh, test tube research is very different than in vivo in a, in a human person. And so what works in a test tube also often doesn't work in animals, which is the next stage of research. And then after animal studies are done, it moves on to human research. And many times, you know, what works in an animal doesn't work in a human. So um, it's, it's promising that we're seeing some of this research. And it's excellent that this is being documented as a problem. But um, I don't think that it's you know a magic bullet at this point in terms of um, you know effective uh, strategy for for treatment because we don't really know uh, the uh, how it, how it acts uh, in a human body with biofilms and with all the complex um, issues that we see there. And, and what is the name of the drug? If you just Dapsone. D-A-P-S-O-N-E. Mm-hmm. Dapsone. So daptomycin is the um, generic name for it. So um, in terms of the treatment approaches, there are many. And there are many different ways to treat this uh, disease and all the co-infections. And there's not one right way for each person. So there's some people that do really well with antibiotics. There's some people do do well with herbs. There's some people that do well with homeopathy or LDI. There's some people that do better with energy medicine. There are some patients that have been treated using all of those things and didn't get better from their Lyme until they treated emotional issues. And um, so I think that uh, you have to look at the whole body and the whole system and the whole person um, and make sure that you're looking at everything because um, it's not all about just getting the right thing that's going to kill that bug. It's really a lot more complex than that. So um, basically, there are the pharmaceutical therapies. Uh, of course, you have to um, really get at the spirochete form. You have to get at the L form, the round body cyst form. So Lyme morphs, and um, you need to be able to have strategies to treat all of those different forms. Um, and basically, herbal antibiotics can be as potent as, as uh, regular antibiotics if you know how to use them. Uh, and uh, they are beneficial in that they don't kill as many good bacteria as bad bacteria. Some of them do, so they're not all equal. But in, in some studies, um, you know, there's many different herbs that really don't kill the good bacteria, but they do kill the bad ones. So if that's an option for people, and it depends on the status of their disease and their, a lot of times their immune system and their age and, and their gut function and a lot of other things, um, herbs can be a viable alter alternative for um, some patients. Or sometimes they're what we go to after a, a more intense um, uh, antibiotic therapy, a, a more of a maintenance kind of thing. So there's many different ways that they can be used and be very helpful. Um, addressing co-existing issues are, are always very important, and I'll be, have some slides coming up which go into this in more detail. Uh, there's oxidative therapies that are very helpful for some people, but they don't work for everyone. Uh, immune modulating approaches, which I think are essential. Oxidative therapies, what do you mean by that? 
Uh, things like hyperbaric oxygen, things like um, ozone. Um, I have another slide and I'll go into more detail in just a moment on that. Uh, and then matrix support is a concept that Christine Gedroyak, who is a medical doctor out of New York, New Jersey area, who I think is a really rising star um, in the ILADS organization and a very bright um, physician, um, has taught me a lot about and, and me listening to her lectures and studying her work. Um, and that if we don't look at the extracellular matrix, we're missing a whole um, aspect that is very important in, in healing and looking at cell membranes and things like that. So I'll talk a little bit more about that. And then supportive mod modalities in general. So for the pharmaceuticals, there's the penicillins, the tetracyclines, the cephalosporins, the macrolides, the azoles, which is the flagell in the Tindamax, uh, the rifampin, which is great for, um, particularly I find it very helpful for Bartonella, uh, quinine, Plaquenil, and then Dapsone and the persister, persister drug. So those are the major antibiotics that are used, uh, classes of antibiotics that are used in treating Lyme. And typically it's three, at least, you know, I mean, you're not, usually one antibiotic isn't enough. So you have to do, typically multi-antibiotic therapy for chronic persistent Lyme. Um, herbal antibiotics uh, are also best used in combination because they, they target different types of uh, Lyme and uh, symbiotically they work better together rather than singles, although there are some protocols that rotate um, and pulse singles that can work like the Cadden protocol and others, but there's many, many, many different herbal protocols. Um, we are well versed in, in many of them. We use many of them and find that for some patients that's, you don't need to use antibiotics, you can just use herbs, but it kind of depends on, on the patient. And in general, I like to try to partner with my patients and find out what my patients are interested in because some people um, really know that they want antibiotics and other people know that they don't want antibiotics. And so uh, I think that our care at, at Newbridge in general, we take this approach that it's really a team. Um, a, a, we're a team. We work together to try to um, really treat. Uh, and so we do like the input of, of our patients in terms of what their wishes and desires are as well. Um, but see, these are some of the herbs that we use. We, we have a whole wall of um, different supplements that, that we use, but uh, a lot of different companies. And we're always trying out new uh, companies because there's a lot of new things coming out, and some of them are, are really promising and are better than some of the older things that um, have been around for a while. So um, Nutramedics is one that we use. Stevia, there was research on the Nutramedics Stevia showing that Stevia worked better than many different antibiotics to treat Lyme. So the Stevia, it's not the same thing as Truvia and the, and the ones that you're getting in your, you know, Pepsi or, or what have you, but it is a natural herb sweetener. And um, I have some patients that they get more dye off from Nutramedic Stevia than they do from anything else that they're using and they're getting better relief from it. Um, it's also very good for biofilm disruption. And so um, it's something that is also easy to give because you can put it in a drink and it tastes good. And you know, um, some people don't like the aftertaste of it, but um, but it, it's, it's actually been a very useful tool um, in the patients that I see, especially when there's a lot of uh, protozoa and biofilm. Um, in terms of um, Beyond Balance is a wonderful line that has uh, glycerin-based uh, herbs, and they're great for kids because they're slightly sweet and um, they don't taste as bad as some of the other ones, so they come in a, a liquid form, which is easier for kids to take. Um, and I think that there's a little bit of something, I don't know that there's any research on it, but some of the rat poison, for example, it, they embed the poison in a food that the rat likes, and so the rat eats it and then gets sick. And I, I wonder if maybe why I'm getting better results for some of the Beyond Balance patients is the lime is coming out and it's eating the sweetness of, you know, um, of the glycerin in there, and then it's getting poisoned. So uh, it does seem to work better for certain people than, than other herbs. Um, and it, it ranges from very mild formulations to pretty potent um, formulations, and they, we usually do it in a stepwise um, approach and they have specific ones for each infection. So they have specific formulations for Bartonella and Babesia and, and Borella and Protozoa and fungus and parasites and so they're, they're very specific for each one. The, the owner of that company, Simon, Susan McCamish, created the line for her son who was very ill with Lyme and he was in a wheelchair at one point and he's now healthy and uh, out there working and uh, doing really, really great and he was treated with, um, with this line. Um, Research Nutritionals has been around for a long time. They've got a lot of really great products, um, and I, I use some of their products and like them quite a bit. Um, Byron White has been an old standby for a long time, has a lot of strong um, uh, herbs that can be very helpful. 
Um, clean heart protocols I find quite useful. Um, they're, they're kind of complex and so, um, and they're, they're, they use a lot of different um, approaches, but in general, um, Dietrich clean, clean Heart has a lot of really excellent um, approaches to Lyme. Um, he's had Lyme himself and his whole clinic is really centered on, on treating uh, patients with really complex chronic illness, uh, many of, most of whom will have, have Lyme. Um, Supreme Nutrition is one of the best herbal lines around in terms of purity and um, quality uh, herbs. And um, they have some very unique herbs that I find work well uh, when other things are not working well. So that's another line that I like. Um, Biopure, Biotics Research, um, the liposomal artemisia is very helpful. Artemisia itself is good, but the liposomal artemisia can be very helpful, um, especially for parasites and babesia. Um, so many people, that's a compounded um, <coughs> herb, so you have to get it from a compounding pharmacy, but um, very uh, effective. Uh, also causes a very significant die-off, so we start very slow and, and work up slowly with it. Um, grapefruit seed extract, many people may be familiar with because it's used as an alternative to flagell to help with cyst busting. And um, I like it because it can allow you, when you're already on two or three antibiotics, to not have to do another antibiotic to, to treat the cyst form. So um, that can be useful. It is a stronger agent. It kills the yeast and bacteria and other things too, but um, that's, uh, that's another one that we often use. Um, the second category of treatment uh, is immune modulating approaches. So the German biologics are a group of uh, homeopathic and sphagyric uh, isopathic medications that are used um, by many different practitioners um, around the country, and many iLabs <laughs> folks are using them. Uh, Pacana, um, I'm sad that Saluna is no longer um, available in the US, but it's a German um, company, but it was very good. Apex Energetics and others um, have some very unique formulations that I have found helpful for my patients. Um, there's some targeted homeopathics. So um, Desbio uh, has a line that is uh, created for Lyme, and it's a, the series therapy. And they have specific um, homeopathic remedies for Lyme, Borrelia, Babesia, Mycoplasma, Parvovirus, Herpes simplex. I mean, the whole gamut of infections, pretty much all of the infections that you want to treat. There's a few that they have missing. But um, that can be incredible for some people. Um, so for some people, they can just be treated with that and not have to do other antimicrobial. For other people, it's a way to um, add support after they've been treated with antimicrobials um, and help them continue to do better. And many people do both um, and get a better result from doing both together or sequentially than, than one on its own. Um, the one thing I'm super excited about in our practice right now, we're using low-dose immunotherapy. And this is a therapy that originally um, Dr. McEwen and the UK developed uh, 40, 50 years ago and was brought to the United States by Dr. Schrader in 2001. And um, in the last few years has been expanded to include Lyme in the arsenal by Dr. Ty Vincent. And um, I am using this extensively in kids and uh, we're getting really phenomenal results with it. And the uh, nice thing about this is, is that it's very easy to give. It's uh, um, drops under the tongue that taste like water, and you only have to take it. Uh, you know, every two months um, is kind of the minimum uh, period. But for people that are anxious to get going and getting more antigens on board more quickly, we can treat every two weeks until we get all of the antigens on board. Um, only one antigen is added at a time. So, for example, uh, if the person has problems with strep and Lyme and Bartonella and Babesia, you know, uh, they may have Candida, they may have other things, herpes simplex 6, Epstein-Barr. Um, we're going to determine which infections are their most problematic infections and go for them first, and then layer on any other um, needed treatments. But um, for some of our patients, they've had overnight improvement. Um, so we've had, we had a child in who has Lyme and autism that I saw yesterday who uh, did the dose of the food LDA and then the dose of the uh, Lyme LDA and and overnight, her ticks went away. Her jumping and stimming, if you know kids with autism, they can you know, get very hyper and stimmy. Uh, that was gone, and um, she was happy. Um, in 24 hours. <laughs> so, um, so there's some really amazing, miraculous things happening with, uh, with, with the LDI, and um, I'm very excited to um, continue using it and, and expanding some of the remedies that we haven't um, tried yet, because so far, in kids at least, we're getting really phenomenal results. Um, 
In terms of the immune boosting um, supplements, there's uh, a lot of times we need to give our immune systems a little help. So um, not only do we need to use the antimicrobials, but we have to help with the immune system modulation. And um, proteus enzymes are taken on an empty stomach. They can be very helpful. Um, they go into the bloodstream and scavenge for all the debris and infections and viruses and outer cell protein wall. Um, and they dissolve it basically and clear it out of your body. So um, many people that are on Lyme treatment really benefit from being on protease enzymes. Um, serapeptase, natokinase, baluk are some examples of those. Um, but in general, they, they can be quite powerful. They are given on an empty stomach and it's, it's difficult uh, because many uh, of us are on pretty complex regimens and you know it's hard to get all of these things in and to fit things in on an empty stomach can be tough. But if you can do it, it um, really can be quite helpful for a lot of people. Um, other immune supports we use are medicinal mushrooms, beta-glucans, um, immunoglobulins, transfer factors, and IVIG is also helpful for some patients. It's, it's out of most people's price range, but for some patients that have hypogammic globulinemia or uh, verified immune deficiency, um, sometimes insurance can cover it. And it's, it's, we've gotten it covered for many of our PANDAS patients, and um, it's been, who also have a Lyme, many of them, uh, and it's been very helpful. So oxidative therapies, um, hyperbaric oxygen is one of the oxidative therapies. Oxidative therapies is basically um, a set of therapies that oftentimes are used as an adjunct. They're usually not used alone, but they're usually used in addition to some other therapy. And um, I know Dr. Salt uh, is using a lot of um, hyperbaric in his patients. We've been increasingly using it for Lyme. In the past, I've used it for autism and uh, other neurologic conditions, but um, it can be really helpful. And um, I have you know, seen benefit for patient, pa excuse, using the soft chamber um, hyperbarics as well as the hard chamber. So um, basically, uh, you can rent a soft chamber in your home, which makes it much more affordable and much easier to do for people not having to drive back and forth to a, a center. Um, in terms of, we are lucky here in Minnesota that we have the Holland Center in Minnetonka, which does um, hard chamber hyperbarics for people that are the Holland Center. And um, um, they, they do an excellent job with patients. Um, in terms of, uh, IV vitamin C is another common one that is used. We don't have many folks in Minnesota doing that, but there are people around that are, are doing it, and um, I'm happy to refer people to that if they're interested in that, and that can be a good augment as well. Vitamin C at low doses is not oxidative, but at high doses, we're talking 80, 100 grams, um, is oxidative. Um, so there's a lot of um, exciting things out there, um, and there's also some IV ultraviolet um, therapies that some people are finding very helpful. I know Andrew Heyman talked about that at, at the last um, ILADS conference, and um, he's getting really good results in some of the clinical trials using that therapy. Uh, we have not done direct oxygen. We usually do the pressurized oxygen with the hyperbaric um, therapy, um, but uh, I'm not aware of any, any studies looking at just the general use of oxygen. But um, anecdotally, I, I know people that uh, have done it and feel better, you know, um, so especially more when they've been in higher altitudes and things. But. Um, concurrent treatment of... Uh, Lyme disease uh, modality, I think it's important to make sure that people are doing diet. So that's the first thing I have on the list. I think it's something that people oftentimes downplay or overlook, but um, I have many patients that just by eating a clean diet can reduce their pain uh, and their fatigue um, absolutely dramatically. So, um, you know, we really recommend that people move on to an organic diet free of genetically modified organisms and importantly the pesticides that are sprayed on them, um, that people get off of gluten and dairy, that you don't do um, alcohol and ideally not coffee while you're in treatment because these are things that are burning your liver and your body has to clear those and then it's not able, it's able to clear the byproducts of infections and other biotoxins and things. So basically trying to have as clean and pure of a diet as possible, um, free of the foods that are causing allergic reactions or um, intolerances is very helpful. We've had many patients that you know didn't really notice any problems with foods until they got sick and then you know their immune systems um, were shot and at that point they couldn't handle the foods, but after they got better, they could handle eating more foods again. So um, a lot of people just don't think about food as part of the treatment because they've always eaten gluten and dairy and had no problem with it. But um, it's a different 
story when your immune system is burdened by Lyme and, and co-infections. Um, uh, your immune system reacts very differently to food in that, in that milieu. And many people get tremendous benefit just from going off of gluten and dairy and sugar. And uh, many times grains um, can be very, very helpful. In fact, uh, at the last immune module from the Institute for Functional Medicine, which is one of the many conferences that I go to every year. Um, they presented some chronic Lyme patients who were resistant to every other treatment, and they tried everything, and they saw the best people and weren't able to get better. And a ketogenic diet um, was able to get uh, the patient better um, when nothing else had worked. So it's basically starving out these infections. So a ketogenic diet is one step above the other diets in that it's, it's a high-fat diet, high-vegetable diet. Um, and and uh, moderate protein and no carbs and no sugar. So no carbs from grains, you get your carbs from vegetables. So um, that diet is used in seizures. It's used in many different um, uh, types of neurologic disorders. I find it helpful in autism and um, many different neurologic conditions. And um, it's something that people might wanna consider trying if you're really sick and wanting to try something new. What do you call that diet? Ketogenic, the ketogenic diet, K-E-T-O. J -E -G -E -N -I -C, ketogenic. It's, there are studies published out of Johns Hopkins um, in the use of this diet with seizures. Um, there's a modified Atkins diet that also has good results with, with seizures, and the, those same diets work um, well for patients with Lyme. So um, if people want to ease into it, if you're not off of gluten and dairy and sugar, do that first and just see if that's enough for you. Um, and trying to eat whole foods and um, move away from the genetically modified foods and the pesticides. If you're still you know, not getting better with your other treatments and that, um, then I would recommend moving on to a paleo or a GAPS or an SCD diet, which is more you just remove, add, do all of that plus you remove grains from your diet. And, um, and then because there's an autoimmune component for many people with chronic Lyme, um, the autoimmune paleo diet is one step up from paleo or GAPS or SCD, and that diet can be really helpful. It's just removing a few additional foods that are a problem for people with autoimmunity. autoimmunity. Uh, and then if that doesn't work, you can move up to the ketogenic diet. So <laughs> ketogenic is pretty hard to go to from a standard American diet, you, you know, so many people need to ease into it. Um, but um, I, I will say, even for myself, if I go on vacation and have a little bit of gluten, pretty soon my fingers start aching and, you know, that sort of thing. If I eat clean and live clean, I don't need to do anything to manage, you know, um, I, I, I do very well. But it's when I'm not eating clean, when I'm eating more sugar, when I'm um, under a lot of stress, I'm not getting enough sleep, um, I'm not taking care of myself, that's when I, I notice problems. So um, basically, I think that that part of the lifestyle is very important for people um, to, to try to get in, into place. Uh, in terms of, um, I do know uh, Lyme uh, doctors around the country that won't see people if they're not doing um, special diets. So they feel that, that, that it's that important to people's recovery that if they're not willing to do a special diet, they're, they're not willing to, to see them as a patient. So um, I, I, I will see patients because I, I, I think it's a journey and every, not everyone's ready and able to do that right away. But, um, but basically I do encourage and we do support people in doing that. We have a lot of classes at our clinic. Every month we have at least three, sometimes up to 10 classes a month um, so that people can become educated. And it's you know, 15 to $20 for an hour and a half taught by um, smart people, you know, practitioners. My, I do a lot of the classes myself. And so that people can learn without having to spend as much money. So basically, I mean, you can ask questions and, and get some support at, at those classes. I also should mention we have a chronic um, complex chronic health issues visit, which is primarily Lyme and mold uh, patients, and um, that meets monthly, and it's welcome, you know, everyone is welcome to that. You don't need to be a patient to come. Um, it's 15 to $20, and um, it's in Edina in our conference room on the second floor, and we'd welcome any of you to come to that or to um, refer to your patients, or um, uh, you can also uh, um, link into that online, so you don't need to come in person if you live farther away. Um, so if you're interested in that, you can just call and register with our front desk and they can give you the code if you're going to be joining in online. Um, and that, that is led, it's not just a typical support group where you're just talking to other people with Lyme and commiserating and getting ideas from each other, which is great and important, but you do get answers because they're practitioners that are leading the group, and so you can ask more clinical questions as well if, you, um, if that's helpful for you. 
So um, kind of moving on to some of the other treatments, um, hypercoagulability is one of the things that Ann Corson really taught me when I was out training with her. That's when your blood gets sticky, it gets thick, because the infections are making um, your blood cells clump together and the, your blood doesn't flow freely. And um, that's why many of us really find these enzymes very helpful. So natto, serapeptase, baluc, um, a lot of other protease enzymes uh, can be very helpful at keeping the blood thin. Um, sometimes, you know, you may even need to put someone on heparin or, you know, something like that to thin their blood, but the enzymes work better and they do more things in the body. So uh, most of us prefer to use um, enzymes, but um, I have a lot of patients that just feel better when they get the, those on board. How do you know if you get sticky blood? Well, if you had a dark field microscopy kind of microscope, you could look at your blood under that and, and tell. Um, there are some videos online you can see, you know, what it looks like when it's clumpy. But um, basically, you could do um, the, the tests that are used to assess for prolonged bleeding time and things like that. Um, uh, but the most common way is just to try the enzymes and see if you feel better. <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's uh, something that, that's very common. And um, many uh, ILADS uh, practitioners, most of them, incorporate this into therapy. Both Dr. Horowitz and Dr. Corson incorporate um, these enzymes into therapy with patients. Um, they have some effect on biofilm too. However, they're not directly um, it's, it's targeting biofilm as much as uh, some of the other enzymes like the Interface Plus, uh, like Biofilm Defense, uh, and many others that are, are specifically designed to dissolve away biofilm. So many of you probably know what biofilm is, but Lyme doesn't live in you know, solidarity. It, it really does everything it can to hide from the immune system. And um, Lyme and many other bad bacteria create a slimy, mucousy, fibrin-rich layer that they can hide under to evade the immune system and evade treatment by medications and uh, other treatment modalities. So if you don't treat the biofilm, you are not effectively going to treat the Lyme because you'll be you're treating what's in the bloodstream. You'll be treating what it can freely get to where the blood travels to. But if you're not getting the biofilm dissolved, you're not going to be able to get at those infections and entirely eradicate them. So um, I find it essential to focus on biofilm related issues. Um, after we start without it, because if you start it too soon, people can get too sick because you'll be unleashing a whole lot of infection that's hiding out under the biofilm. So we start with antimicrobials first and then layer in the biofilm um, agents um, once the person is, re is ready for that. Uh, in terms of um, nutrient deficiencies, Lyme tends to create a lot of nutrient deficiencies. It's, it, you know, your body has a lot more needs for nutrients when it's sick and trying to heal. So um, typically we find that patients with chronic Lyme and other complex chronic illnesses um, have a lot of nutri nutrient deficiencies. And it's even more important to have a nutrient dense diet and uh, to also do things like juicing and you know, vegetable and fruit smoothies and um, some supplementation targeted at, at their specific um, deficiencies, which can also be um, impacted by genetics. So I've been studying genetics the last, really intensely, the last six years or so, um, and found it to be very helpful in helping my patients figure out where their blocks are and um, which pathways aren't working right. And if we can support methylation and detoxification and mitochondria and all of these different pathways, um, we can get better outcomes and people feel better. So. Um, Moving on here, mitochondrial dysfunction is an area that a lot of people um, don't know about, but um, increasingly in medicine, we're learning a lot more about it. There's a plethora of research on the mitochondria, and the mitochondria are the powerhouse of your cells. They're the, the, in every cell of your, of your body, and um, they are the batteries of your body. So basically, if your batteries aren't working well, nothing in your body is going to work well. So a lot of times, just by supporting mitochondria, people have the energy to fight off their Lyme. Their immune systems work better. You know, everything works better. So for people with mitochondrial issues, which primarily comes out in fatigue, so, and people are often very fatigued with, with chronic Lyme, um, but sometimes it's the infection and sometimes it's also mitochondrial dysfunction. So um, there are functional tests like the NutraVal and other tests that can give you an idea of whether um, mitochondria are a problem. You can also test CoQ10 levels and carnitine levels in the blood through standard testing to see if those are low and if they are 
those are um, clues that you might have mitochondrial issues. Um, and beyond that, there's ammonia and lactic acid and other testing that you can do. Um, and if those are uh, abnormal, that, that's more uh, additional information that you may have a mitochondrial disorder uh, or more likely a dysfunction, um, not so much a disorder. So basically, oxidative stress, I don't think I've ever seen a patient with chronic Lyme who has not had oxidative stress. And um, that's the body's way of trying to do what it can to fight off some of these things. So I mentioned earlier there are oxidative therapies which can be used. Um, and the body's trying to do some of that on its own by creating you know, increased oxidative stress. So one thing I think is important for people is to not go overboard in the beginning of the treatment of their infections with really high dose um, antioxidants because that's gonna reduce your oxidative stress and that your body is trying to create this oxidative stress to fight your infection. And so basically, we like to do testing to find out where people are at and then, um, you know, make sure that we're treating infections before we're loading on lots and lots of antioxidants because otherwise you're kind of taking away some of those defenses that the body is trying to do to, to um, heal. Uh, toxicity is uh, important because most uh, patients with uh, chronic illness, including Lyme, have heavy metal and man-made chemical burden that is uh, not getting out of their body. So many people have poor detoxification pathways and they're not able genetically and they're not able to detoxify as well as the next person. And most patients that are really sick and aren't getting better, you wanna look at, at heavy metals and man-made toxins and work on strategies to detoxify. And for many patients, that's what really tips them over the edge. If they've done everything else and they're not getting better, that's something that needs to be looked at. Um, the other thing that I see as really crucial for patients that aren't getting better is mold biotoxin illness. So if, if people haven't found out if they have mold in their home, you really should have someone out to do an assessment. Uh, if you're well enough, you know, read up on it and do your own assessment. But um, mold is in one out of every two homes. So um, half of us in the room here have mold exposure in our homes and the other half probably Probably have it in our workplaces or places of worship or other places that we go to. So if you happen to be someone who has a genetic um, haplotype uh, in the HLA DR um, category, you don't have the ability to clear the mold and Lyme biotoxins that are produced by mycotoxins, which are the toxins related to Lyme, and the mold, um, excuse me, the mycotoxins are created by mold and the Lyme biotoxins that are created by Lyme and um, its associated diseases. So those toxins just hang out in your body and they continue circulating and they make you sick. So you have to bind them and help them clear the body. So sometimes simple binders like charcoal or um, modified citrus pectin or apple pectin or um, you know, chlorella or things like that can be really helpful um, in clearing out those biotoxins. Um, they also help with herxing. So the herx reactions that, that people have are, are helped by binders, but binders are oftentimes underused and um, they're very, very helpful uh, for patients um, dealing with any kind of biotoxin illness. And Lyme, I mean, I've never seen a Lyme patient who doesn't need them. <laughs> so um, it's something that I, I think is very uh, important. And I mean, charcoal is very inexpensive. So it's something um, that most people can add in to their um, regimens. Um, in terms of um, histamine, infections create histamine. Uh, you need to have methyl groups and good methylation to be able to clear histamine. Uh, and increasingly, we're seeing a lot of mast cell disorders and um, histamine uh, issues where people can't clear their histamine and it's, it, there's a lot of chronic illness related to high histamine and it's related um, issues. In fact, we have uh, Lawrence Afrin, who's an um, expert at the University of Minnesota um, in mast cell disease and histamine issues. Um, we didn't used to need people like him, but now we do because we have so many people that are having issues with histamine. So for people that are having those issues, sometimes treating their infections and, and getting some methylation support on board, some active B vitamins and things like that can make a world of difference and helping them be able to handle their, their um, histamine levels better. Um, so, and, and it's very complex, but those are just a few um, issues that can be helpful. What is a mass cell? Uh, mast cell is part of the immune system, and basically it, it is uh, overactive in people with the MCA, the mast cell activation disorder. So the mast cells activate, and they cause a lot of inflammation, a lot of damage in the body. And people with mast cell activation syndrome and high histamine levels are usually quite ill and have a lot of other problems. They often overlap with autoimmunity, um, and you need to eat a low uh, histamine diet, sometimes take histamine blocking supplements. Um, 
and medications um, and work on supporting methylation. And if you do all of that, it, it is treatable, but it's very complex and um, most uh, physicians don't understand it. And so thus, Dr. Afrin is into 2018 for his waiting list um, at the U if you wanted to go see him. So um, basically, um, it, it's just another thing to think about. If you tend to get hives or a lot of allergies or anaphylactic reactions to things, you absolutely should um, look that up and, and read up on it and try to figure out if that might be something affecting you or your loved one. Uh, in terms of um, underlying genetic pathway weaknesses, there's methylation weaknesses, which are probably the most famous, the MTHFR mutations, which would be the C677T and the A1298C, which are the most common. But there's a whole plethora of other um, genetic polymorphisms that um, influence uh, health. And um, there's a researcher um, who's interested in genetics who has done some research looking at which uh, genes seem to be overrepresented in patients with chronic Lyme. And he's got some interesting information about that on dnasupplementation.com. Um, his website um, has a couple different evaluations of uh, SNPs that are more common in patients with, with Lyme. And he presented at ILADS last year as well. Um, so that is something that I um, study and incorporate into my um, treatment with patients. What was that again, DNA? dnasupplementation.com. And Bob Miller is the naturopath that is looking at some of that. There are many other folks, um, Ben Lynch, and uh, uh, lots of other folks that are, are looking into this uh, as well. Um, I, I like Opus 23 as a software. Um, it's kind of the newest one that I've been uh, working with to help me uh, help patients better to, to interpret and understand their genetic issues. The 23andMe is the basic information that you, you use to get your raw data, and then it needs to be fed into a software to help, help with uh, interpreting um, all, of, all of that data. And yeah. Has yeah, we, we can ha take people's 23andMe information and help them um, interpret their, their data. Um, so matrix support, which we talked about a little bit, um, but that's a lot of the use of phosphatidylcholine. Dr. Gedroyak and Dr. Carson and others find that really um, instrumental in helping heal. Um, Dr. Dr. Gedroyak at the last ILADS conference um, said that she's been able to get some of her sickest Lyme patients better in six months um, by adding phosphatidylcholine on board. So phosphatidylcholine is something that um, is very helpful with that extracellular um, uh, matrix support. And um, basically, you're out cell membranes are made up of mostly phosphatidylcholine, which is a fatty acid. And um, for most people, because of diet and infection, um, those cell membranes get um, rigid. And the phosphatidylcholine and eating a high healthy fat diet um, can help make those membranes more pliable. And that helps infections get out of the cells better and nutrients and other good things to get into the cells better. And so um, the phosphatidylcholine, butyrate oxbile kind of protocols that Patricia Kane and Dr. Gedroyak and others are using have been, have been really helpful for a, a lot of people. And, and uh, more recently, there's more and more practitioners that are doing the oral form of this, so you don't have to do the IV form, which is costly, um, and at least more costly. The, the oral form is, is not cheap either because the, the actual phosphatidylcholine is quite expensive, but, um, but it does work really well uh, for patients um, in conjunction with other therapies. It's usually not done alone. It's more of a supportive therapy. And then um, we talked a little bit about the genetics, but it, it's really epigenetics is kind of the most important thing uh, in terms of looking at, at health and, and vitality. Um, and epigenetics is basically um, involved with lifestyle to impact your gene expression. So. Um, 90%, some people would say 95%, some people would say 80%, but a high percentage of your health is really predicated by uh, what you put in your body, what your body's exposed to, your attitudes, your lifestyle practices. And only you know, five to 15% of, of illness is really related to your genetics. So I think that in my parents' generation, you know, the belief was really that uh, you, if you had a particular illness, it was um, because of your genes. And we 
we know now that uh, you can have identical twins that both have you know, the same genes to predispose them to getting diabetes. And if one is eating lots of fruits and vegetables and exercising and the other one isn't, you know, uh, very, very commonly we see that you know, the lifestyle factors can prevent the expression of some of these um, chronic diseases. So, and um, for Lyme, I see it to be true too. So the lifestyle that people are, are um, incorporating um, can be very, very helpful in bringing healing and preventing reoccurrences once, once they're well. So the matrix support is really looking at um, cellular drainage and respiration, the phosphatidylcholine, um, I, I talked about a little bit of that already. Phosphatidylcholine also can emulsify or break down the biofilms, so it's, it's helpful in getting rid of biofilms, and um, helps the cell membranes be fluid. So um, that's something that, that we add in for patients that are interested um, in that. And then the ad additional supportive modalities that people find helpful are far infrared sauna, uh, the biomat, which is a far infrared mat that people lay on, hyperbaric oxygen therapy, Frequency-specific microcurrent, the RIFE um, technology is helpful for some people, the pulsed electromagnetic fields, um, IV infrared energy medicine techniques can be really helpful for a lot of people, um, and uh, emotional clearing techniques. Um, again, I wouldn't um, downplay the impact of emotional trauma on our health and wellness. So there's many people that are holding you know, past hurt or abuse or just negative thoughts, you know, that may have been instilled in them in childhood or, or any time in their life, that if you can let go of some of those negative thought patterns, um, your immune system gets stronger, your body gets stronger. There's a whole mind-body, um, you know, connection that I think people um, uh, oftentimes benefit from when they can tap into that. Um, and so dealing with, you know, emotional things. Dr. Dietrich Klinghart just recommends people spending 20 minutes a day while they're healing. Um, writing a journal and just writing everything you can think about from you know your childhood onward uh, in terms of you know hurts or traumas or regrets or things you wish you would have done or things you did do and you wish you wouldn't have done you know just whatever get it out and if you can get that out you usually feel better and and your immune system is better and you heal better so um, journaling and other ways emotional freedom technique and other things that can be helpful in um, clearing um, some uh, past trauma um, there's lots of different um, modalities that can help with that. So in general, I think, you know, approach to Lyme treatment isn't just about treating the bug or the bugs. You know, that's part of it. It's a big part of it. But um, we find that for people to truly get better, you have to look at everything. And not everyone does. So some people can get by with doing just smaller um, treatment. Uh, I have some patients that are, are doing well with just the LDI therapy, and they're not needing to do anything else. I have other patients that can just do, you know, not an intensive antibiotic um, course and, uh, you know, a little bit of nutritional therapy, and, and they do well with that. The the majority of patients that are sick and that have been sick for a long time need to do a lot more. They need to look at the infections, all of the infections. They need to look at um, detoxification and what, what uh, toxins are in their system that are preventing their immune systems from working uh, appropriately. And they need to look at lifestyle factors and kind of the whole host of things that we've been talking about tonight. So um, I do find that the more frequently I can check in with my patients and they can check in with me when they're especially dealing with the most critical time in their illness, when they're really sick or just starting therapy, um, that if I can see them once a month in one way or another, whether it's in a group session, a support group, a one-on-one -on -one visit, a clinical group session, those patients get better faster than the people that I only see every six months or you know even every three months. So um, I do encourage people to try to, if they come in for a one-on-one -on -one visit, initially to try to get to those support groups every month or try to get to, um, you know, if it's more affordable for them to do more regular visits, if they do a group visit, to get into a group um, and do a visit because the, the, if you're starting treatment and maybe something's not going well, um, and then you quit the treatment or you're, you keep doing it and maybe you should be quitting it, you know, or you need to change path. Um, if you can talk to your practitioner about that and get feedback, um, you're gonna get you know, better, faster than kind of getting stuck in a treatment that's not working for you or, um, you know, needing to change course. So um, I do encourage all of you to make sure that you're checking in as often as you can with your practitioners. How long of a waiting list do you have? 
Um, we have brought on three additional practitioners because my list was way, 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 way out. <laughs> so um, because of that, it's not it's not bad anymore. So I can usually get new patients in within two months. Um, and um, sometimes if people aren't uh, wanting to wait that long, I encourage them to get in with one of our other practitioners to get testing going, to get treatment going. And um, if they if they want to, they can transfer to me later. But we work as a team, um, really, and we have uh, meetings every week where we go over cases together and I consult with um, everyone in the practice um, on cases that they're having questions about. So um, so basically, we, we it's, I would say two or three or four brains are always better than one. So um, that's how we, we kind of operate. So um, in terms of other thing else, the molds and the mycotoxins are an area which I think um, more and more eyelids practitioners are getting into because they're finding that if you don't deal with mold and mycotoxins, um, that is a big uh, problem for a large subset of patients that have Lyme. Um, some of this HLA haplotype that I was talking about uh, makes it hard to clear mold biotoxins, but also Lyme biotoxins. And many people have both, so they're just not able to clear those toxins, and those toxins are burdening their immune system and their liver. and, and and, you know their whole their whole their brain everything so um, working with someone who is familiar with how to detoxify from mold and clear mold is really helpful do you have um well, there's companies that help you, absolutely. Um, so we have a, a number of different practitioners um, that do mold remediation and things like that. And the first thing you need to do if you live in a moldy house or you're working somewhere moldy is get out of there, you know? So basically, um, and, and sometimes you can remediate your house depending on how extensive the mold or water damage is. Um, and sometimes it's better to move. But um, we've had patients in our practice that have done both and um, it depends on the extent of the damage and how well you can remediate. But um, some people will not get better if they're living in a moldy house until you move um, or until you remediate. So it's an important thing for people to, to assess and look at. Um, there's the home remediation part of it, and then there's the medical remediation part of it. So Dr. Neil Nathan and Dr. Richie Shoemaker are two leaders in mold, mycotoxin, biotoxin illness that I use a combination of their protocols. Um, and in our practice, we, we do that. So um, if you haven't looked into mold, um, survivingmold.com is a good website you can look at to help you um, get some information. Um, there's also, um, my, ho my house is making me sick or something like that is another website that is very helpful. There's a Facebook base group book called Mold Avoiders that a lot of people find really helpful of patients that are dealing with um, mold biotoxin illness. And mold biotoxin illness looks identical to Lyme. So many people that think they have Lyme might actually be dealing with mold biotoxin illness. So I think it's important for people that aren't responding to the, the typical Lyme treatments to be looking at the possibility of, of mold biotoxin illness. Um, all of these slides will be available on the website, so um, you'll be able to access all of this information you know, at a future time. So electromagnetic and microwave exposure is also really important. Um, I know Dr. Klinghart really emphasizes this in his work, but um, I see it very important in the kids that I see is that we're all bombarded with microwave radiation, cell phone towers, computer screens, phones, you know, it's become a really important part of our lives. Like, you know, if I don't have my phone, I'm in trouble, you know? So basically, but the problem is, is they emit a lot of uh, radiation and electromagnetic fields that are harmful to, harmful to us. And the literature is catching up. Um, there's, the research is coming out uh, that this is something that is really a problem. There was just actually on Facebook, there's been an um, article about some girls that have, I think somewhere in Scandinavia, who did a science experiment and they had cress, which is a, a rapidly growing plant, and they put cress in a um, room where there was no electromagnetic radiation or routers or Wi-Fi or anything like that. And then they put the same, um, they, they just put dirt and put the seeds in basically. And they put the same, uh, planter in uh, a room right next to a router. And uh, you can find it online if you look. And uh, basically, the cress next to the router um, turned brown and died. And the cress in the other room, which got the same amount of water and sunlight and everything else, was thriving and green and healthy. So that's just a very 
obvious example of the damage that electromagnetic radiation can do, but there is published literature, if you go on PubMed, which is the National Institutes of Health Clearinghouse for Medical Studies, you can find a plethora of studies about the negative effects of electromagnetic radiation, everything from cancer to um, skin, you know, oozing skin um, ulcers from electromagnetic radiation. So it is a significant problem and something that I think that, that people need to look at. In the autism field, they've done a, um, some work on what they call a clean room, where they put air filters and electromagnetic shielding, like a mosquito sp sp screen kind of over your bed that, you, that actually filters out electromagnetic radiation and have the kids sleep there and breathe clean air. And um, a huge reduction in autistic symptoms just by doing that. So um, there, th we do know that electromagnetic radiation is, is very harmful um, to health. It's particularly harmful to people that are sick um, with chronic Lyme and, and other chronic complex conditions. And um, Dr. Klinghart really feels that people will not become well if they don't um, get rid of their EMF um, burden and, and distance themselves from that. So it's something I, I recommend that people do. There's some simple things you can do, even just to reduce your risk of cancer, um, is just don't have your phone up to your ear. Talk on speakerphone. Um, have your phone on airplane mode when you're not using it. Uh, and uh, only turn it on when you're going to make a call or you need to check to see if someone is calling you. Um, don't keep it at your bedside. Most people keep their phone or tablet right at their bedside as an alarm clock. That's one of the worst things you can do because all night long you're getting bombarded. Um, kids' brains are, are very um, penetrable, much more so than adults. So. A cell phone next to a child's head is going to go completely through their head and irradiate their, their head. Um, adults, it's going to go in a few inches. So um, there's been a huge increase in brain tumors, and the World Health Organization has um, declared cell phones as level two probable car carcinogens. So you know we know this is a problem. If you read the fine print on your phone when you buy it, it says it's a problem. <laughs> um, and of course, we don't read our fine print, and we all like our gadgets. And the uh, companies that make the gadgets don't want anyone to know this. So basically, it's not talked about much, but um, Paris has taken Wi-Fi out of their public schools and public libraries because they're so concerned about the effects of, the, uh, of this on, on growing brains and, and children. And um, it, I, I think it's a great idea. I think we're creating a huge experiment on our kids and all of us, really. Um, and we really need to be studying it more and evaluating it more. So I'm just going to um, talk a little bit about the prevention of vector-borne Lyme uh, because that's the best thing if we can prevent this from happening rather than being sick to begin with. So this is kind of a lot of small print. Um, I'm not going to read it all, but you know some simple things like avoiding tick-infested areas, especially in the spring and times where the tick counts are very high. Um, walking in the middle of trails instead of kind of on the edges. Um, don't sitting on logs and wooden stumps and you know th things like that where you're more apt to get things crawling up. Um, tuck your pants into your socks. You know, um, spray your clothing with appropriate um, <coughs> repellents. Um, I think that if you're spraying your clothing and you don't have skin contact with your clothing, you can use some of the more harmful um, tick repellents uh, because you're not getting them on your skin. But um, on your skin or anything that's going to touch your skin and with children that are, are more prone to problems with some of the chemicals, I prefer that you're using agents that are less harmful, like the lemon eucalyptus. Um, and in terms of you know checking your body frequently, um, you know checking your kids when they come in. Um, but Lyme can be transmitted the instant it bites. So the the it's a fallacy, uh, in my opinion, that you have to have a tick embedded for 24 hours or 36 hours. Um, you know I, I know kids that have had and on for 15 minutes and you know, had Lyme. So if that tick is very virulent and very loaded with infection, um, it can be in their saliva and it can be transmitted in a much shorter time period. Um, so basically, if you live in an area that has a lot of infestation, you may want to clear away um, the area right next to your house. Um, if you live with a wooded area in the backdrop, you may want to put some kind of um, barriers in between your yard and, and the forested area. Um, there are companies that specialize in doing this and can help, help you design um, ways to make this uh, be uh, oh, basically less exposure in your backyard, you know, that can design your landscape um, architecture so that it, it can improve um, the 
tick, uh, decrease the tick presence. So there's lots of other ideas here, but um, if you're interested in looking at all the details, you can, you can go on the website later um, to, to look at that. But I think it's one of the most important things um, that if, if you have Lyme or a loved one has Lyme, if they get reinfected, it's just that much harder to treat them. And uh, if you can avoid getting infected uh, again um, or getting infected in the first place, you know, that would be ideally what we want to do. And on, on that note, because um, I see so many patients that uh, are children that have gotten Lyme in utero, uh, we, and not just because of that, but also because um, I believe that you can uh, really prevent a lot of this through preconception counseling, uh, we have a monthly preconception class um, at Newbridge where um, we're teaching moms and dads how to get healthy before they get pregnant so that they can, uh, you know, get healthier so that they can avoid having a child who is burdened with autism or ADHD or dyslexia or Lyme or um, autoimmune disease. And there really is a lot that you can do if you start preconception and during pregnancy, um, the decisions that you make and the health to try to prevent a lot of that. So um, there has been some retrospective chart reviews by some physicians that in the MAPS group, I am a member of the Medical Academy of Pediatric Special Needs, and um, have looked back and for patients following these recommendations, um, there's been no new kids born into their practice with autism, uh, with diabetes, um, with you know autoimmune disease. Um, and it really does work. In my practice, I've been um, counseling patients one-on-one -on -one for many years, and none of the patients that I've counseled, um, like they're usually older kids have autism or ADHD or other health problems, um, and then the moms and dad wants to get pregnant again and, and prevent this from happening in their younger kids, um, you know, they're at a much higher risk of developing those problems because of the fact that they have other children. And we haven't had anyone um, develop uh, any of those problems who have followed our recommendations. So really, a lot of this really needs to be about prevention. So um, there's a lot that we can do um, to help prevent a lot of these um, problems. So we recommend, um, you know, depending on the person, testing for infections before you get pregnant, pregnant, testing for toxicity, um, looking at your nutrient levels, making sure you're not anemic, making sure you have enough zinc, making sure that, you know, you're really um, eating a good, healthy anti-inflammatory diet um, and that you're really healthy and that your gut is healthy so that your microbiome is healthy, that that baby will travel through and swallow all of those uh, uh, good bacteria that starts to form their immune system because baby's bacteria form their immune system. And in that in utero, in the first month of life, and the first three months of life also, uh, to a lesser degree, is how they form their immune system. So in order to fight off Lyme and all these other you know, infections and immune burdens that are out there, they really need healthy immune systems. So. Um, I did include here um, some information. I, I do have some prevention of the maternal Lyme, which I really mostly talked about here. Um, the cost of Lyme, uh, basically taking care of Lyme patients um, is costing the healthcare system 12, uh, $712 million a year um, and uh, $1.3 billion a year, excuse me, between, that, um, between those amounts. And um, that is really underestimated because there's a lot of people that are paying out of pocket for care for Lyme that aren't even using the, the main system. And so um, it's a huge financial cost for people. Um, this is 2015 data. Um, it's a tremendous monetary cost because many people, as you know, with chronic Lyme can't work or they are, are underemployed because of their illness. Um, parents uh, of kids with Lyme can't work because they're taking care of their kids. Uh, and uh, you know, it's a huge emotional toll and social toll on, on families. So we've we talked a little bit our, about our group visits. We um, have started some group visits starting with autism. We've, we're now moving on to Lyme and have those available for people. Um, they meet every other month. They're um, about a fourth of the cost of a traditional one-on-one uh, -on -one visit. And it's with a small group that you stay with so you can get to know other people that are dealing with this and they can provide support, which is also helpful outside of visits. But um, it's uh, been really helpful for our pilots that we did in 2016. Uh, our patients that participated in a group visit got better faster than our patients who did not. So, and I think some of it is that um, collegiality and sharing with other people and the contacts that people make um, so that they have support outside of visits as well. And some accountability, the visits are pretty frequent and so um, people are, are able to uh, get more support and, and follow up. So um, we also have our, our groups, which I, I mentioned. Um, we also have a care coordinator who can help people in between visits um, clarify their care plan or you know touch base if there's if there's problems. Um, and then we also are offering the online options for people that can't come or we see people from all over the country and even internationally. So um, people can tap in um, by webinar or um, computer. 
So I'm not going to go into this because it's late and um, we all need to get home, but I did include a bunch of slides on the microbiome because the microbiome, I believe, is something that we have to think about when we're thinking about the treatment of chronic Lyme. Um, the microbiome is all of our good bacteria in our GI tracts and the importance uh, on our health. And um, I've had some patients that have been seen and had, you know, seven, eight years of antibiotics, and they weren't helping them, but they continued on the antibiotics. And they, they you know, come in and their guts are just destroyed, their immune systems are destroyed, they're really sick. And, you know, um, those people need a lot of help. And so if we can prevent some of that by being smarter with our treatments and using antibiotics for shorter periods of time when it's appropriate, um, granted, you know, there's a different treatment plan for each person. So you can't say that there's one right way to do things and one wrong way to do things. It's very individualized. But um, trying to do whatever we can to use probiotics um, and to uh, damage the microbiome the least amount possible is gonna be helpful for all of us. Um, so I'm not gonna go over all this. I'm just gonna skim through it. But I think it's something that is important for everyone to think about. Um, this is a little cartoon on, on the microbiome. Um, we have many different individual micro, microbiomes in our body. So we have a gut microbiome, a vaginal microbiome, a skin microbiome. You know, there's all of these different microbiomes. Our right hand and our left hand only share 5% of the same microbiome. So you would think your hands, you know, would be the same microbiome. Only 5% of the bacteria um, that's on your right hand is on your left hand. I mean, that's how specialized our microbiomes are um, in our bodies. And our brain even has a microbiome. Um, Lyme becomes part of that microbiome. And uh, as we get older, a lot of our DNA actually are not our DNA. It's the DNA of our bacteria. So we have 100 trillion times the bacteria in our body than we do our own, uh, our own DNA. And um, that DNA influences our health and behavior. So we have to be kind of looking and nurturing um, uh, that microbiome. So I, I list a bunch of studies here. I'm not going to go into any of them because we're you know, getting late here and I, I want people to be able to have some time for questions. But um, Basically, this is a beautiful picture of our, our microbiome, but dysbiosis of the microbiota, that small intestinal bacterial overgrowth that, that I, um, I know Dr. Bradley has technology to look at and that we test for in our clinic, um, is very important for a large and growing number of diseases. So we now know that certain bad bacteria in the gut can predict pan pancreatic cancer. So if you can crowd out that bad bacteria before you get pancreatic cancer, you could per perhaps avoid pancreatic cancer. You know, we know that there's a lot of bad bacteria that contribute to disease. So if we are totally destroying our microbiome with just antibiotics that aren't working for us, you know, and lots of C-sections and not breastfeeding and, and genetically modified foods which damage our microbiome and EM electromagnetic radiation and all these other things that are influencing us, um, we really, uh, may be causing a lot of problems down the road. So I think we need to tend our intestinal garden. So um, these are just a list of diseases that are uh, a problem um, that are caused by bad bacteria imbalances in our gut. Um, it has a role in metabolic disease, cardiovascular disease, and infl inflammatory joint disease, chronic bowel inflammation, uh, bone metabolism, um, childhood cavities are predicted by your gut microbiome, not by how often you brush your teeth. I mean, that's about a 10% impact, but 90% of it is your bacteria in your mouth and, and your gut. Um, basically, gingivitis and dental implants, you know, the, the microbiome is very important uh, for the cause of, of gingivitis and problems with, with dental implants. Asthma is impacted by our lung microbiomes. Uh, gut microbiota, um, microbiota causes vascular disease. Um, they cause autoimmune disease. There was just a paper published that antibiotics in childhood uh, increase the risk of autoimmune disease in adulthood. So um, there's a study showing that antibiotics in childhood increase the risk for obesity in adolescents. Uh, antibiotics in childhood increase the risk for mental health illness in adulthood. So we know that our gut microbiome is so important, and so I do think we have to be good shepherds of it and make sure that we're using antibiotics widely Wise, wisely, and that we're not consuming genetically modified um, organisms that have lots of pesticides on them that, that decimate our microbiome, and that we're not doing other things that are, are harming our microbiomes because they're critical to health, and um, we don't want to be tra always trading one problem for another. So the urinary microbiome and an infection and incontinence. Urinary tract infections and incontinence are related to our microbiomes. Um, lower gut micro microbiome diversity um, is very implicated in polycystic ovary syndrome. 
Um, the role of the microbiome is related to surgical outcomes. How healthy your gut is relates to how well you're gonna do in surgery. I mean, this is amazing information. And this lit review that I did was for a lecture that I gave at the Minnesota Medical Association uh, holistic group. And this, these research articles are just 40 of the articles that I pulled from the first two weeks, and I'm sorry, the first week of 2017. These are from the first week of 2017. And this is only 40 of the 300 that were published in that first week of 2017. So this is a tremendous you know, um, issue. Uh, if these are the studies that are coming out in one week, and this is only a smattering of them, you know, it's a huge, huge, huge issue. Um, obesity is related to gut microbiome. Um, we know that patients who get a gut, uh, stool transplant from a person who's obese because of C. difficile infection, for example, um, ha and, and has happened that the, the person that was skinny before that had the C. diff that got the stool transplant from someone who's obese becomes obese. Um, somebody who's anxious that donates their stool to someone who was never anxious before but needed it for C. difficile infection has become anxious after the stool transplant. So our gut microbiome influences all aspects of health and it's just, it's really critically important. Um, so circadian rhythms, emotions are impacted by our gut microbiome, neurotransmitters are impacted by our gut microbiome. Um, I, I'm not, it just goes on and on and on. Colorectal cancer can be predicted by fecal microbiota, um, predicting colon cancer as an adulthood. I mean, it's just amazing the impact of this. So um, I'm not gonna go on because I could keep going on and on and on and on, but basically um, I, I'm really happy I was able to come today and share some of this information about different treatments for Lyme, about the microbiome, about options that people have that can help um, save money in the management of, my, of Lyme, and just the importance of kind of looking at the big picture um, in the treatment of Lyme. And um, I would like to open it up to questions if anyone, if anyone has any.